Kitco Mining special coverage of Fast Markets Lithium Supply and Battery Raw Materials is brought to you by Lindian Resources. The energy storage sector is set to grow exponentially, according to Battery Analyst for Fast Markets, D.B. O'Hara. Baby, welcome to Kitco. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us about energy storage sector. Why is the sector growing? I mean, if we look just at 2022, we saw the market double um, in and of itself, which is huge. So it's gone to over 75 gigawatt hours in terms of its capacity. Yeah. Um, and the amount of policy incentives we're seeing across multiple different locations, um, I think, really tells a big story. Um, so I think... And the difference is, is with EVs, we've seen the dominant market spur growth because of the um, like financial incentives that have been going on there. And the difference with energy storage is that every country in the world has an incentive to green their grids. And with that comes an added incentive to add batteries to your grid. So that means that there's a much more diverse pool of people introducing ESS into their you know, demand sector, should we say, for batteries. So if we take some examples... Um, China, we've seen the introduction of a really advantageous policy where essentially the provinces are required to introduce a battery with any new renewable energy source. So for every 10 megawatts of solar, you have to have 10 to 15% of that being batteries. That's a huge, when you think about the scale of China, that is absolutely massive. Similarly, Kings of India, I think, is a great example for emerging markets also doing you know, really exciting work in the space. So India announced a 450 gigawatt renewable goal by 2030. And with that, they said that they want 108 of the gigawatt hours to be batteries. So that is, I think, also highlighting the case of India that it, it doesn't really matter what market you're at um, in terms of the levels of batteries you already have. If you've got a really bullish renewable goal, you can bring in batteries very early on to add like part of that to the grid. Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking about overall demand as a result, ESS is going to be really fast growing very quickly as countries, like I've said, are really pushing the renewable energy story. So that's why I think it's so exciting. But there's a whole bunch of technologies that are around uh, energy storage. Yeah. So I think about, you know, there, there is the uh, sand batteries. And I, I love yeah. saying the word sand battery. Uh, but there's also the uh, reverse hydropower in mm -hmm. mines. There is also a lot. I don't know, help me out, Vanadium yeah, 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 yeah. as well too. But you see that there is also going to be a space with critical minerals, even considering how expensive they are. These Definitely. Days. So I think let's break it down because it's yeah, important yeah. to understand what we're talking about. So with energy storage, um, a large percentage historically has been hydropower, right? Mm -hmm. So taking water from certain heights and using a turbine to create electricity. Mm -hmm. What we've seen over the last three years is the growth of what we call electrochemical storage. So that's typically using batteries or other forms such as compressed air or gravity, which is a very cool case, so I won't go into it, but I strongly advise listeners, watchers to look, up, to look it up. When we look at electrochemical as a basket, 95% of that is currently lithium-ion. Okay, so huge lion's share. And the majority reason is because right now we're looking at two to four hour duration for energy storage being the most popular. It's a short term solution market right now. Okay, mm -hmm. we're going to get to long term later down the decade, which we can talk about later. But right now it's short term. Lithium ion batteries don't really have a competitor in that space because of the cycle life that they provide because of the cost efficiency right now. We have a forecast for chemistries, alternative ones over the next decade. And what I would say is that towards the end of the decade, we're going to see the rise of sodium ion. And adium redox flow, as you mentioned, is very popular in China. So I think we're expecting it to have like a 1.2% market share globally in 2030. But I think sodium ion is more of a competitor if we look at all of the other kind of technologies that could come to the market. Now, Phoebe, uh, you're the auto person, I believe, yeah. here at uh, Fast Markets. We pay attention to uh, the auto industry. We pay attention to trends because yeah. we see this EV evolution that's happening right now. Yeah. And then that's really going to push demand for critical minerals in the space. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. All like, right. Okay. <laughs> Just be given given the scale. Yeah. What's going to happen? Yeah. You had an interesting point uh, within your research. You were talking about the five percent uh, point uh, and yes. uh, getting above five percent penetration. Yes. What is that? So the five percent is typically seen as a tipping point whereby EVs enter mass consumption. So when I'm mentioning 5%, I'm talking about the EV penetration rate. And so when we see EVs become more than 5% of the total amount of vehicles sold within the year, 
That's typically seen as a moment whereby consumers are taking up EVs at a pace similar to a commonly found petrol car. And that number's been reached um, by market research, not by us, but historically through other scientists and research bodies. Looking, if you compare the historical data from China, Norway, these markets are far advanced in EV uptake. And there's a really cool map that you can have a look at, which maps that kind of S-curve that we see. And there's a bite point here that's typically 5% where it rises exponentially. We've seen that take off in our own research if we compare um, the 5% mark with across Europe, even Latin America. So what we're typically looking at on our research is how many markets in the world are passing that 5% point, okay? And what we found is that when we do analysis on a regional basis, this year we're going to see Central and Eastern Europe as a region and also the rest of world category pass that 5%. So that's really exciting. That means on a general basis, we're seeing EVs become incredibly more commonplace around the world, which is a huge boost for demand and a lot of opportunity for the critical raw material sector. Let's uh, stick with the uh, North American and uh, Western markets for a minute yeah. uh, before we go to China, which yeah. is uh, the big dog yeah, yeah, yeah. as well. What's the state right now? I guess it's just Tesla's story and that's it. Is that correct? Um, I mean, it, do you know what? There's actually quite, it is a Tesla story in the majority. They have the biggest amount of sales and that's yeah, yeah. deniable. But I think what's also really fascinating is if you look at the Ford F-150 Lightning, okay? Mm -hmm. Came to market last year and sold out within the space of a couple of days. And people, there's now a long wait list to procure that vehicle. And I think what that highlights is that consumers aren't just buying EVs in the US because it's a Tesla product. They're buying EVs across the board because they're interested in these new products that OEMs are offering. And I think that's a real boost to uh, the green transition space for a number of reasons. The first is that that indicates that consumers actually like these products as products. It's not just that they're a fad or, like I've said, they're brand specific. And I think what the F-150 Lightning did is it showcased specifically to America that we can get you a pickup truck that looks like your petrol car, but is fully electric. And I always like to cite that as an example because I think it's an exciting level of innovation that we're seeing across the space. And with the IRA and the huge levels of incentives that that's given across the value chain, right? We always talk about the consumer breaks, but let's also talk about the battery production brands that are people being offered and also the car production, you know, consumer alternatives. So I think across that space, it's, it's a very exciting time to be in the US and we're seeing a lot of tech and R&D innovation that's really cool to watch. Let's go to China. So yeah. uh, we had a slowdown, I believe, at the start of the year. Uh, it's June 21st right now. Yeah. There was an announcement that China is going to be extending the tax rigs yeah. for purchasing uh, EV vehicles. I think the other data point that interesting was uh, BYD, uh, the leading EV uh, manufacturer, uh, seller. Uh, they had their numbers came out. They beat a Tesla by about 100,000. But I think that was uh, combined EV as well as plug-in hybrids. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a strong mark. It's, it's an unbelievably strong market. Um, I think let's start with the first part of what you said, okay? Yeah. So at the start of this year, we saw the market contract by 4%. So that rung alarm bells because China makes up around 60% of global EV sales. So if we think yeah. about demand and the metal space, no, that has consequences. What we're seeing now, as you said, you know, we're in June, we have seen demand rebound. So it's gone back to a stronger point of growth. So in April, we saw at least 60% growth year on year. Mm -hmm. If you saw that in other markets, you would say, amazing, that's really strong growth. The problem is we're talking about China. And China over the last two years has been over 100%. So that's the kind of rates that people are looking at. So I think something I would say to listeners and to people in the space is that, yes, demand has dropped and it's sluggish, but it's not negative and it is still at a rate that is you know, positive and upbeat. And that's the story that we're looking at for the rest of the year. It's not going to be the same level of growth that we've seen historically because the market's more mature. So it's going to be at your around 40, 50, 60% year in your growth, which given the amount of vehicles in the market is a lot of vehicles still being sold. And I think that's an important differentiation to make. Last point you brought up BYD. Um, when you look at BYD sales growth, it obscures the broader China story, I think, because BYD is doing so well. Actually, some of the data I was looking at when you compare all other OEMs, right. so with their growth levels are fluctuating. They're finding it hard to take market share because BYD is doing so well. And people like Tesla have also got such good volumes. So I think something else to look out for, though, is, is there's going to be a point at which some of these OEMs don't make it. 
there's too many of them in the marketplace, it's oversaturated, and the sluggishness that we're seeing means that there's not as much opportunity. So that's the only thing that I would highlight when we're talking about brands doing really well. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and some of the other government regulations that have been built, um, those have been kind of, I should say, kind of moats that have been put to uh, protect the American carbon. Yeah, I want to get the quote right, uh, but that was uh, from Bloomberg, and this was uh, BYD's uh, global expansion head, Stella Lee. She was saying that the various tax incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act have made the U.S. market too expensive yeah. to unpower. Yeah. Well, maybe. So, um... Oh, I'm struggling to think of how honest I can be in terms of speaking to different areas. We know for a fact that BYD is not going into the U.S. There were yep. plans in place for them to enter the U.S. And overnight, those plans had to be in stoppers. Um, I think it's a shame on a, on a personal level if we think about affordability. Yeah. Um, the cars that BYD would sell in the U.S. would be different. It goes without saying. But if we look at the market prices in China, some of the models are reaching a $10,000 rate price. Mm-hmm. When we think about the next levels of EV adoption, the really critical market we need to open up to is the low to middle income consumer. They currently have been impeded from entering the market because the U.S. is based on luxury pricing. So what BYD would have offered, and other Chinese brands too, is a much more affordable batch of vehicles that would be really advantageous to those consumers. So they're not in the market now. I don't think in this current geopolitical climate that's going to change anytime soon. But, you know, they are in the energy storage space. So it's not that there isn't a total loss of appetite for Chinese brands here. And I hope that sometime in the future that would potentially change. Now, lastly, Phoebe, what are some of the trends that you're taking out, you're noticing for the rest of the year? Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the rest of the year, something that I'm really focusing on personally is waiting for CATL and BYD to introduce their sodium ion batteries into cars. They've announced they went to do it in the second quarter of this year. They've pushed that back to Q4. And I think that's going to be really um, important because we haven't seen them being rolled out in, in EVs yet. It's been a big discussion of what they could do to the market. Until we see them in EVs, we're going to then start to understand what it looks like and what they can achieve. Um, some other trends that I'm looking at on the lithium side. Sorry, Phoebe, just to uh, just to clarify, though, what yeah. uh, sodium ion being a replacement for uh, lithium ion yes. uh, being made with cheaper materials, yes. but there might be some disadvantages regarding range, yes. also commerciality and getting up to scale. Yeah, there's a few key things there that's, that's really fascinating. So some new research came out by Minvero, which is a great research house um, that looks at this kind of stuff. And they were looking at the full life cycle assessment of a sodium ion cell. And what it shows is that um, on an ESG basis, actually, because of the hard carbon anode that right now is being used in sodium ion, on an ESG basis, it isn't actually that great if you're, because the hard carbon is an offset of a you know, patch of chemical processes. So although people have been talking about sodium ion as a really great option in order to hedge against volatility in the lithium market, what we're actually seeing now with lithium prices coming back coming back to a good rate um, and this kind of ESG question around sodium ion we're not seeing as much appetite so I think you know, I mentioned the last quarter of this year with EVs being rolled out I think the rate at which these OEMs roll out the sodium ion will give an indication of their views on the market which I think is also helpful for us to understand mm. what, how they're trying to hedge against this volatility and invest at the same time into different battery chemistries so it'll be really exciting other trends you're taking an eye on? <laughs> Other trends that we're keeping on so many. I mean, uh, the amount of batteries coming to the market is just in the ESS space, as we mentioned a few of them. So I'm trying to track, you know, what's the appetite for flow batteries versus vanadium redox flow in China? Um, is there feasibility with ESS companies taking them up? At, oh, and at what point will that happen? Um, nice. For some reason that I can't really understand, hydrogen is still very much on the table when we're talking about EVs and energy storage systems, I personally think that it's a lost cause, but I think I still need to be engaged in those conversations in terms of OEMs. And then coming off the conversation I just had, which is fascinating, was different OEM strategies in the upstream um, and energy storage companies. I'd actually highlight that as my key thing that I'm looking out for. So the problem with energy storage is they're playing second fiddle in terms of batteries to EV manufacturers right now. So the OEMs have a huge kind of capacity to debate and engage with battery manufacturers because of how large they are. Energy storage companies, by comparison, are a lot smaller. And the problem with them is that they're dealing with the same risks in the market as EVs, but they have less of a um, bargaining power. 
thing. So what we're going to need to see there is a greater diversification of strategies and firstly how they hedge against the volatility, but also ensure that they can get an accurate supply of batteries for, as, I, as we've mentioned, a growing exponential industry. So I think ESS strategies in the upstream is also something that is going to be a really fascinating thing to watch unfold. Um, and they're very much still in the planning stages, so we'll wait and see what happens. Oh, so Phoebe, yeah, thanks for speaking with GetGo. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. My name is Michael McRae here at the 15th Lithium Supply Band Battery Raw Materials I'm show here in Anderson, Nevada. Here, Kitco Mining special coverage of Fast Markets Lithium Supply and Battery Raw Materials is brought to you by Lindian Resources.